Welcome, my friends, to Winslow United Church on beautiful Prince Edward Island. Thanks so much for tuning in and making us part of your worship experience for this week. Now, folks, have you ever heard the nursery rhyme that goes like this? Mary, Mary, quake and prairie, how does your garden grow? With sil silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that my wife wouldn't like it too much if I had a bunch of pretty ladies all hanging out around my garden. I figured the only thing that would grow then would be the lump on the side of my head. But one thing that does tell you is that anything that grows is a struggle. To get anything to grow is a struggle. Now if you're a gardener and you want your, your garden to grow, you have to struggle with, with, the, with the weather, you have to struggle with pests and deer, and you have to struggle with the soil conditions. If you're a business owner and you want your business to grow, you have to struggle with inflation, downturn in the economy, you have to struggle with supply chain issues, you might even have to struggle with your own employees. And for all of you who are parents out there, I don't have to tell you the struggles that it takes to raise your children to maturity and to adulthood to give them the best shot at life. But I want to ask you, what about your faith? What struggles do you have with that? How do you get that part of your life to grow? Well, there certainly are struggles indeed, and today we're going to be talking about that issue. And so, I'm here, and you're here. So, let's go praise the Lord. Well, folks, our scripture reading today is from the book of Matthew, Matthew 13. Now Jesus, unlike many of us preachers, was very interesting and charismatic. What he used to like to do was paint these beautiful word pictures of contemporary life, things that his audience could understand and relate to. And then what he would do was relate these abstract cosmic truths to that picture that he painted, thereby allowing all the people who listened to him to connect that cosmic truth, that abstract truth to contemporary life so that they could understand what Jesus could was talking about and could relate that cosmic truth, that, that abstract truth to something that they knew and held so dear. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Jesus is talking about your faith. He talks about a faith that he plants in your heart and in your mind. And has to grow. And he also talks about how your faith can grow and the struggles that you're going to have with your faith. He gives you warnings about, about things that you might fall into, but he also gives encouragement that no matter what you're struggling with, that there is a gardener there, the gardener that planted that faith and that will tend that faith so that it will grow and bloom into something that's beautiful. And so, Bella, can you read us our scripture for today? Matthew 13, verses 1 to 9, the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear.
history, humanity has had to struggle. We've had to struggle against nature, and we've had to struggle, well, we've had to struggle against each other as well. Sometimes these struggles have been epic, and the great men of history have been defined by these struggles. Wellington, he struggled with Napoleon at Waterloo. Churchill, he struggled against Hitler in Europe. Batman, well, he struggled against the Joker in the streets of Gotham City. And in a small town in Nova Scotia, J.D. Kennedy struggled with Amanda Julian. Now folks, Amanda Julian and I were like, were like oil and water. If I went right, she went left. If I said white, she said black. And if I wanted to stay, well, she wanted to go. And so, the struggle went on. Now I remember it was a sunny day when Jamie Gage came running over to me and said, Hey JD, come quick. You gotta see this. It's so cool. And before I could, could even say a word in response, there he was off running down the street. Now, swept up in his enthusiasm, I ran after him. After all, I had to see what was just so cool on a warm summer day. Now as we turned on to Acorn Street, I could see that there was a bunch of kids standing around in a rough circle around Tommy Lyons' house. Now we, when we finally got there, I pushed through that small crowd to see what was going on, what was so exciting, and what was so cool. And when I got through that crowd, sure enough there it was, that cool item that, that gathered such a crowd, a great big cinder block. Wow! Look at that, said Jamie. Isn't it cool? Yes, yeah, said Tommy. Isn't it? How did it get there, I asked. Don't know. It just was there. It wasn't there this morning, but, but when I came out after lunch, there it was. Maybe somebody was carrying it, and it got too heavy for them, and so they just dropped it. Now, who would be carrying around a a huge cinder rock, said Jamie. That's too heavy to lift. Well, I can lift it, said Tommy. No, you can't, said Jamie. Yes, I can, said Tommy. Prove it, said Jamie. Well, Tommy bends down and, and he heaves and he hoes and he pulls and he tugs it. But he can't lift it. Can't lift it off the ground. Now, of course, we were a bunch of boys. So this brought a whole bunch of, of gales of laughter and derision from us. Then Jamie said, Step aside, my man, step aside. And he bends down, and he tugs, and he pulls, and he only gets it up, you know, about this far off the ground. Just enough to get his fingers underneath, and then get stuck underneath this great heavy weight. Now, of course, this brought a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of, of dancing around, and, of course, a whole lot of laughter from the rest of us boys. Now, finally, it came to my turn. I bent down, and I grasped the... Un grasped the cinder block, and I pulled, and I puffed, and I lifted. And sure enough, I got it waist high. And then, I got it up to my chest. And then, I got it right over my head. And that's when I heard it. That prissy, pip squeaky voice that was like nails on a chalkboard. So, what's going on, guys? And if you haven't guessed, it was Amanda Julian. Hey, look, Amanda. Look how strong J.D. is. He's lifting that cinder block right over his head. Well, Amanda Julian pushes through the crowd, looks me up and down and says, The only strong thing about J.D. is his smell. P.U. And look at that little pebble. My baby brother could, could lift that little pebble up. No problem. Now, I have to say, that I was wanting to say something rotten about her and her baby brother, but that cinder block was, well, it was getting heavy, and I was really wanting to put it down. Move your foot, Amanda. This block is too heavy, and I'm going to drop it. J.D. Kennedy, she said. You are not the boss of me. My father said I can put my foot anywhere I want, and I want to put it right here. And she put her foot right in front of me. And this is where I want to have it, 
And this is where I'm going to leave it. Okay, Amanda. I'll just drop this block on your foot. Oh, no, you won't, she said. I'm wearing my brand new shiny black shoes. And you are not going to get dirt and dust and cinder block stuff all over my brand new shoes. Okay, then move your foot, Amanda. I'm too smart for you, J.D. Kennedy. I'm not going to move at all. Okay, then. And with a huff, I dropped the cinder block. Now, I'll tell you, the way I remembered, is that I didn't try to drop it on her foot. But guess what? That's where it landed. Squarely on her foot. Now, there was a, a sickening crunch, followed by the most ungodly scream that you have ever heard in your life. And that was followed by Jamie Gage hollering, Stagger! And so, we all ran. We all ran our separate ways, with, with Jamie and I running right into the woods, where we spent the next several hours building a tree for it, and wondering if Amanda's toes were broken. Well, when our belly started to rumble, we headed back home for some supper. Now, I invited them to, to come to my place for a grilled cheese sandwich, because I knew that's what we were going to have. But as we turned into my driveway, we both froze. There was something there, something we didn't want to see. You see, there, on my front step, was a cinder block. Not any old cinder block. It was the exact same cinder block that I had dropped on Amanda's foot. Well, Jamie looked at me and I looked at Jamie. And Jamie said, well, it looks like you're in trouble. Yep, I said. I guess I'm not going to get that grilled cheese sandwich, she said. Nope, I said. See you tomorrow, asked Jamie. Well, maybe next week, I said. And with that, he went his way. And I went in to face the music. Now, when I went in, I discovered that Amanda's father had uh, brought the cinder block over to show my mother this huge cinder block that I had thrown at Amanda. Now, I tried to plead my case. I tried to tell my mom, you know, what really happened, at least my version of the story. I tried to tell her that I'd asked Amanda to move her foot several times, and when I dropped that cinder block, I tried to miss. But you know what? My mom wasn't interested in listening to what I had to say. You see, she had made up her mind. And so, I got a woman. Now, you might be asking, why is J.D. Kennedy telling us this story? Well, I'm telling you this story because it is a story of three people. Three people who did a whole lot of talking, but who did no listening. You see, Amanda was intent on bossing people around and getting her own way, so much so that she didn't hear me saying, that I couldn't hold on to that cinder block much longer, that it was too heavy. And me? Well, I was so busy trying to get my way that I didn't hear Amanda saying that she just wasn't going to move her foot. And my mother? She didn't want to hear my story. And even if she did, she might have acted the same way. But she was so busy exercising her authority as my parent that she didn't want to listen to me. She felt she already knew everything that she needed to know. Now, folks, I tell you this story because Jesus tells us that if we want to have the power and the peace and the joy of the kingdom of heaven, then first we need to listen. If we want our, our lives to be transformed, the first thing that we need to do is to listen. You see, Jesus didn't come just to preach the doctrine of forgiveness of sins. No, he came preaching the coming of the kingdom of God. And what's the kingdom of God? It is no less than the power of God in heaven coming right into this world, into this world to, to heal every alienation and every brokenness in every dimension of human life, be it emotional or physical or relational or spiritual or racial or even psychological. How is this kingdom to be brought about? 
How are we to enter into this kingdom? Through listening. And that's why the Bible says, So then faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. You see, every earthly kingdom grows and spreads through violence. Through violence, through force, through manipulation and coercion. You see, whenever Alexander the Great came to your city, you either became part of his empire, or it was destroyed. Coca-Cola. It has become one of the world's biggest brands through multi-million dollar advertising campaigns, devious business practices, and by buying out their competition. Amanda Julian. She used intimidation to get her way. I used a great big cinder block on the foot to get my way. Every earthly kingdom grows and spreads through violence, through force, through manipulation and coercion. You either conform and join up or you get swept away. In fact, leaders of earthly kingdoms are notoriously bad at listening. They have their own goals, they have their own agendas, they have their own, own thoughts and plans and that's what they're going to do. As such, they have no time to listen, and so they don't. They don't listen to anything else. But Jesus, Jesus says the kingdom of God is different. It comes as a simple, life-altering truth. It's not forcing you. You know, you have free will. We talked about that last week. You can walk away at any time, and folks, many people have. But, when Jesus plants that seed of truth in your heart, it takes root, and it begins to grow. And as it grows, it begins to transform you. Transform you from the inside out. Your beliefs change, your attitudes change, your relationships change, how you view this world changes, you know, your values change. You change. As that truth takes root and grows, we become committed to Jesus' priorities and to seeing them worked out in our lives and in this world, in this present age. What happens? The kingdom of God grows. It grows, and we grow closer to it. A cinder block dropped on a ground changes nothing. All that changes is that the surface you know, might be broken by sheer force. But a small seed, a small seed, planted in a heart changes everything. And a small seed planted in the ground changes everything around it. It changes everything about the ground and the environment. It can change the ground, it can change the lawn, it can change the property, it can change the acreage, it can change the world. You take a look at Alexander the Great's empire or Caesar's empire, or Napoleon's empire, or Hitler's empire. Where are they now? They're nothing. They've been condemned to the dustbin of history. They're just a footnote in a history book now. But the worldwide Church of God? It's still here. It's still feeding people. It's still inspiring people. It's still healing people. It's still transforming people's lives. It's still saving people. So then faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the Word of God. But folks, do you remember at the very beginning of our service when I said, everything that grows faces a struggle? That applies to our faith, too. Even a seed that's planted by Jesus Christ himself into our hearts, there's struggle. There's a struggle that it faces as it grows. And so... Here's the warning, the warning that we need to hear. Be careful how you hear. You see, to hear this warning, the warning in our Bible passage for today, is very important. You see, our church roles, you know, people who have been baptized and, and who have become members of our church, our church roles are full of names of people who, who never appear in church or in any other church. They've heard the word of God but it's not growing in them. You see, not only do you have to hear it for it to fully take root, but you need to understand it. And it has to be nurtured. Now, that's why coming to church is so important. 
That is why Bible studies are so important. That is why good preaching is so important. And this is what this parable is all about. You see, it gives tests or warnings about how you listen to God's Word. Beware of listening to the Word of Jesus with a hard heart. Well, what does that mean? That means listening to God's Word with just your mind. You know, it talks about a seed falling on, on rocky ground. It can't germinate unless it actually goes underneath the ground. The Word of God. It doesn't do anything if it never penetrates your heart. Now, I'm not just talking about, about atheists here, no. You can come to church, you, know, you can read all kinds of Christian books, you can come to Bible studies, and yet it never makes a personal penetration of your heart. For these kinds of people, Christianity, well, it's only a, a the theoretical exercise. These are people like Nicodemus, you know, that guy who came in the middle of the night to debate Jesus, to find out what he was all about. But really, he wanted to know what Jesus was all about, but he didn't want to have anything to do with them. These are like, you know, the students that take on the course of world religions. You know, they are curious about them. They might want to know a little bit about them here and there. But, well, they don't really want anything to do with them in their lives. They're like people who, who come to Bible studies, but don't really want to learn what the minister or the Bible study leader has to say. No. They come to debate the leader and be, you know, the devil's advocate. This is a warning. Is this a warning for you? Is this the category in which you find yourself in? Are you listening with a hard heart? Well, ask yourself this. Have you ever come under the personal power of the truth? Have you ever encountered the Word of God, whether it was, was being preached or, or read or, or whatever, and suddenly you start seeing things about yourself or your situation that you'd never seen or thought of before? Has there ever been a time when you felt like you have woken up from, from a sleep, a sleep to a truth that you'd never, ever thought of before? Oh, you may have known about it, but now for some reason it seems to be real. It seems to have, have a great meaning for you in your life. Has there ever been a sense of it thrilling you, or amazing you, or inspiring you to do something different? Things that you never thought you could do, never really wanted to do, but now you do. If not, you've been listening to the Word of God with a hard heart. Maybe for your entire life. The seed has fallen, but it hasn't penetrated, and it's bounced away. That's the first warning. The second warning is this. Beware of listening to God with a shallow heart. What does that mean? That you only listen emotionally. It doesn't penetrate up here. It penetrates only your heart. And folks, this is a scary one because it talks about people who get very excited about Christ. They've said, you know, Christ has changed my life. I have gone down in the power. And they do feel that, that he has opened their eyes. But watch out. These people are likened to those whose roots are not that deep. And they wither. They wither in the heat of the sun. They just can't take the heat. They're there for the good time. The good time. But not the long time. You see... As soon as suffering comes into their lives, as soon as, as trouble comes into their lives, they turn their back on Christianity and said, well, you know, it didn't work. I guess it was all a lie. What's the use of Christianity? And Jesus says about these people that, that instead of wanting to enter Christ's kingdom, they really just want Christ to enter their kingdom. And they really want Christ to fulfill, fulfill their agenda not wanting to pursue God's agenda for them and their lives and the people in their, their communities. I'll put it to you this way. They wanted to have a blesser, not a savior. Someone to bless what they're doing, not to save them from what they're doing. Or perhaps to put it more bluntly, they wanted a sugar daddy. They didn't want a king. But this shows, 
is the things they really worshipped are the things they lost in that heat. They came to Jesus thinking that they were a sufferer in need of a solution instead of a sinner in need of a savior. They might have had, legitimately had, this personal experience of God, but it didn't lead them to repentance. Which is why, perhaps wrongly, whenever I hear someone say, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious, I always think of this part of the parable. And lastly, don't listen to Jesus with a divided heart. And folks, this is the scariest warning of all. This is the scariest warning of all. And I say this because, you know, well, it's easy to see that the first two groups, you know, aren't really Christian at all. There are people on the roll who never come, who never think of coming. But the people who follow into this group, this warning is the one that most deeply affects the people who actually come to church. They're the ones that actually have deep roots. They stick around. But they fell amongst the weeds. And the weeds, they're choking them. So they don't produce what they should. These are people who love and accept Christ. But Christ is not in full control of their lives. For some reason, Christ only shares control. There's something else in their heart that's almost as important or more important to them than God. Jesus, he's part of their lives, but only part. They worship Christ, but they worship other things as well. And as a result, their Christian life is choked, stunted. They don't see themselves changing. They don't they don't see the healing. They don't, they don't see the power of God acting and working in their lives or through their lives. They don't see others being changed by them. And if you're one of this group, then I'll say that I'm truly sorry for you because you are the only ones who are truly miserable. The other two groups, they figure Christianity is a crock and they've already moved on. But here you are. You can't go back because Christ is in your heart. But you can't move forward because these other things are choking your spiritual life. You may be saying, but J.V., I have these thorns in my life. I have these, these stones in my life. But listen, removing these stones, removing these thorns is not the job of the soil. It's the job of the gardener. The job of the soil is to simply receive the seed, to hear the word. It's the job of the gardener to remove the stones, to remove the thorns. So stop trying to be in control. Stop sharing control. Just go to the gardener and tell him, Lord, I have stones in my lives that I can't move. I have thorns in my life that are holding me back, that are hurting me, that are cutting me, that are choking the spiritual life out of me. There's so many things that, that I know are there that are, that are being offered, but I don't feel them. There's these stones that are in my way. There are these thorns that are holding me back and cutting me. See, Lord, I need them removed. I have these weeds in my life that, that have to be taken out. Go back to the Word and hear it, or read it, or think about it, or, or work it out in your life. Work out the implications for your life. Give yourself to it. And when you do, what will Jesus say in return? He'll say, of course I will. In fact, I've already taken your thorns. I wore them as a crown. And I've already moved your stones. You see, they buried me behind them. And I just rolled them away. And that's what I'm here to do for you. And so, my friends, faith comes by hearing. And by hearing the Word of God. But, 
be careful how you hear. To which I can only say, thanks be to God, and amen. And now let us pray. Loving God, many years ago the word that you gave us was planted in our hearts. And Lord, what was said and what we understand is attractive. It pulls us towards us, towards you. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, has been working in our lives. And yet, O oh Lord, there are thorns that cut us. There are, are stones that hold us back. For some, it's the thorn of loneliness. For others, it's the stone of wealth. For others, it's the weeds of popularity. Lord, there's all kinds of things that's in our lives. Things that, that stop us from fully committing to you. Things that, that choke away our joy. That choke away our peace. That suffocate our happiness. So, Lord, we come to you. We come to you and say, Lord, be the gardener. Be the gardener in your field. Take out these weeds. Help us to hear what you have to say. Allow your word to penetrate deep, not just into our minds, but into our hearts. Allow the word to grow, to grow in our lives. Lord, we want the peace and the happiness. We want to be close to you. We want to be part of the kingdom. And so remove those things that are holding us fast. Lord, all the other things that, that we want in our fields, all those other things that turn our eyes or we want to share our lives with, we, we know. We know that we can't rely on them, that they bring more trouble than they have. They make promises they cannot keep. So, Lord, we, we turn our mind and heart to you. We ask for the joy and the peace and the happiness that only you can give. Lord, on behalf of the people who hear my voice, on behalf of the people who come to Winslow United Church, and, and for those who can't, I ask your special blessing upon each and every one of them. I ask for you to, to till their fields, to plant the seed deep into their hearts. I ask for the sunshine and the rain, for your word to grow in their lives. I ask your special blessing for those who are ill, or for those who are in the hospital. May you bless them with healing and with understanding. For those who are lonely, I ask you to walk close to them so that they can feel your presence. For those of those, and for those of people who have, have wandered away, I ask that you call to them, go to them, and lead them back home to you. Lord, these are the prayers of your people on this day, O oh Lord. Hear our prayers. Amen. Well, my friends, we've pretty much come to the end of our time here together, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in and making us part of your worship experience for this week. And folks, at the beginning of our service today, we went through a nursery rhyme. A nursery rhyme that said, Merry, merry, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Now, folks, I can guarantee you two things. The first thing that I can guarantee you is that none of those things will actually help your garden grow. But the second thing that I can guarantee is that if you want faith, hope, love, joy, salvation, and happiness to grow in your life, well, the first thing that you need to do is have the Word of God planted in your heart in your head. Now you might be asking, J.D., where can I go for that to happen? Well, one of the places that you can go is the church. A church like Winslow United Church. And so, if you've never ever been to church before, or if you haven't been to church for a long time, please, please consider this to be your personal invitation to come right here to Winslow United Church. Get to know God. Get to know His family. Have the Word of God planted in your heart, in your mind. Have it fertilized, watered, and grown. 
by the Son, the Son of God. And so, my friends, until we meet again, and we still shall meet again, stay safe, and may God bless you richly. Amen.